Last year, we did a lot of content with this idea of the permanent championship window, perpetual reloading, how you need to address the startup in order to get enough picks in your rookie draft of the second season to really build the sort of unstoppable juggernaut. Now we're into the time period where we have those picks and we're looking to deploy them to create that dynasty team. And one of the questions that we get both sort of in the particulars and in the general sense, is how do you go about these trades within the context of rookie drafts outside of rookie drafts in order to build these elite teams and Colin, we've got some great examples today of some of the things that we're trying to accomplish. There's one of these that's an absolute blockbuster trade, and you've titled it Trade Type 2, Adding the Best Weapon in Football. And that there is Jonathan Taylor. So we have a trade that's Joe Burrow, Irv Smith Jr., the 308 for Jonathan Taylor and Jameis Winston. We talked about the Saints on last week's podcast. There's questions there, but you know, could still be a valuable piece this offseason. But the big key there is Jonathan Taylor. But one of our other favorite guys in Joe Burrow is in the mix there. Let's uh, fill the listener in on, you know, we're looking here at basically a, a three for two offer that we're, we're submitting. Um, how did this trade come about? Well, one of our trade partners, and in this case, it was a lot of fun because it is a Rotoviz listener, reader. Uh, sometimes it can be easier to work out trades with another member of the Rotoviz community. Sometimes it can be a little bit trickier because they're approaching the league from the same perspective. But this is one of those where I think the rookie drafts are so helpful because they bring everybody together and they create this environment where managers are looking to change their roster and to make trades, right? And so we're actually on the clock at the 308 and our potential trade partner was interested in that pick. And one of the things that can be tricky sometimes is moving an individual piece can be hard, but if you sweep it into the context of a larger deal, then you can make some of these things work. And it may seem silly that the 308, which is a player that probably isn't going to have a huge impact would be the catalyst or the facilitator to get a big trade done. But sometimes it's that last little piece that helps you kind of get over the hump, right? So we're looking at this, that kind of starts the conversation. And we're basically saying, look, we, we don't have a specific piece on your roster that we really want more than making this pick. But you have Jonathan Taylor, we're loaded across the board with the not surprising exception of running back where we do have a zero RB ish build in dynasty as well on a lot of these teams. And so we've got like 12, 13 wide receivers. The vast majority of them actually impact wide receivers, not just, you know, end of the roster guys, but our running backs are Devin Singletary and Daryl Henderson. And we like those guys, but you're probably not going to win your championship with those players unless everything kind of breaks right for Henderson, like it did last year. And then he stays healthy and actually, you know, capitalizes in the fantasy playoffs, which we, we didn't get. Singletary, on their hand, very interesting. You know, they add James Cook. I like James Cook. I think that he could be the guy there, but there's still a lot of paths for Devin Singletary to score a lot of points. You know, win you your titles, still be a good zero RB piece if he's being drafted 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 in your best ball leagues. But we want Jonathan Taylor. We ask about that. We send a variety of trades that include wide receivers. Not surprisingly, the answer is, Okay. The player that we want on your team and the player who has a similar value to Jonathan Taylor is Joe Burrow. You probably don't want to trade him. We probably can't get a deal done. And so, you know, my response to that is, yeah, we don't, we don't want to trade Joe Burrow. Right. But we've been moving through this draft, acquiring quarterbacks. And now our quarterback depth is pretty good. And if things break the right way, we could see some of these guys hit. We have Mac Jones. We have Zach Wilson. Wilson, a very poor rookie season, but there's enthusiasm around him again now with the addition of Garrett Wilson. It looks like they can have a very dynamic offense if he can play at all. We know that that's going to raise him, at least within the context of 2022, he could score some points. If he breaks out, you have this massive dynasty asset. If he doesn't, then probably still a little bit tradable, but he's going to score some points for you that season. We add Matt Corral. It looks like he really is already in the mix for beating out Sam Darnold. We had Marcus Mariota. He's someone who looks like he's going to start the season. And so you're thinking, okay, well, you know, is there a path here where we would trade Joe Burrow? 
And probably the answer is still no, right? Because Burrow is going to be a fantasy factor for the next 10 years. Jonathan Taylor is going to be a fantasy factor for the next three, maybe five. And you look at that, and especially within the context of Superflex, where these quarterbacks are so valuable, uh, it would be hard to make that move. And so I have Joe Burrow uh, a couple, like two spots ahead of Taylor in the Dynasty Superflex rankings. They're both in tier one, which means I've assigned them the value of three first round picks if you're going to trade picks for them. Even that, in a lot of cases, is probably still not going to be enough, right? But they're at least that valuable, but they're in a tier where you could kind of move them for each other. So we start to talk this through. Monty and I are both like, we think that with the QB value we have, it's not going to suddenly put us in a very narrow path to victory if we make the trade. That's always what we're looking for. Never make these trades where suddenly now everything has to go right. If it goes wrong, you're suddenly rebuilding. We don't want to be rebuilding. We're in this permanent championship window, right? Not this illusory one or this short-term one. Will Taylor make that work? We start talking through the trade. It turns out that Irv Smith... And the 308, again, this pick that we kind of started out the conversation with are pieces that our trade partner would be interested in. We had made the decision to draft Trey McBride earlier in the second round, even though we already had good tight ends. And Jameis Winston was a piece that could potentially come back. And so you're looking at that and thinking, okay, well, Winston adds another guy. And this was a little bit before they signed Jarvis Landry. Now with Jarvis Landry, it'll be interesting to see, right, how the Saints address this if they keep the handcuffs on winston it's going to be pretty tough for him to have too much value but again a super flex he could have that low end value if they just let him go back to playing the way that he played and he's going to have much better weapons right even if michael thomas is still messed up which i don't know it doesn't seem like the you know the signals are really necessarily that great for him right now you're going to have the situation where winston can score some points he's also someone that you can kind of retrade and maybe pick up a future first i mean these quarterbacks who are going to start and are now locked into starting and with the moves that the saints have made i mean it's certainly not a done deal that he's the starter in 2023 as well but they're kind of moving in that direction with the moves that they're making i think they certainly would hope that he's the starter that season you know multi-year starter you're going to be able to make a second trade so with that being the case monty we go ahead and pull the trigger and this trade is joe burrow Irv smith the 308 for Jonathan Taylor and Jameis Winston. What are your thoughts about this? Obviously, again, I mean, Joe Burrow, a piece you're not necessarily looking to give up. You're not looking to give up, but you're also going to have to give something up if you want to acquire Jonathan Taylor. They're both players who are going to be at the top end of most people's values or most people's rankings, and they are going to be hard to move for or acquire um, at this season. That's just the, the, the nuts and the bolts of it. A couple of things that you mentioned there that I thought were uh, you know, prominent to pick out. We did talk last week, I believe it was, about having a trade that you did where you had drafted Justin Jefferson and then traded him away, you know, while still in that draft. And in this situation, you're after touching on Jameis Winston, where you're after acquiring that piece where, you know, he may never play on your fantasy football roster in 2022. You may move him on. And I think that's something to always think as well when you're looking at it. You look at your QB room now, you have Mac Jones, Matt Corral, Zach Wilson, Jameis Winston, and Marcus Mariota. And, you know, not the most beautiful room, but in terms of options to start in Superflex, I think it's a really strong depth that you have there and you can move some of those pieces to then kind of shuffle that roster around. The other question that I was going to, or the other part I was going to mention, you you mentioned that, you know, making these moves not to cripple your roster or limit those paths to victory. I think it's very important to not, you know, sell the farm, as people would say, to go out and get Jonathan Taylor if the rest of the roster isn't that you know, one or two pieces away. And I think with how you talk through that, that would be very evident to people listening in that that was part of opening those paths to victory for you. The question I was going to ask, though, is 308. You mentioned at the start of that point that it may be something as small as the 308 that may get a deal like this done. Was there a point where that pick became a sticking factor? Or how do you decide on which you know, picks that may be added into a deal like this to just edge it over the line. I know in the past you've talked quite a bit about doing trades where maybe the player that you're actually targeting is the player that you look as a, a throw into that draft um, to try and to try and boost it up for you. Occasionally it can be a sticking point, right? Because we're talking about these pieces. They do matter, especially in super flex, they matter, especially in the triflex leagues, they're going to matter because there are veterans in there who are also pushing some pieces down. And 
Yet at the same time, because some of these smaller picks can be the sticking point, it also makes them such an important and meaningful factor in terms of the discussions and getting the deal done. So just to give a little bit of context and, and who these picks turn out to be, this is kind of fun because we had a lot of picks in this area. And again, this is sort of the perpetual reloading, the permanent championship window idea, where if you move down in your startup and you've acquired a lot of picks, then you can just do so many things and address so many different pieces, right? And so in this draft, we ended up having the 207, the 210. We select Alec Pierce. We eventually trade out of him. We have the 212. We select Tyler Algier. We have the 301. Sam Howell, 302. Marcus Mariota, 303. Wondell Robinson. So we're able to really go after these guys that we want. And then we're out for a few picks. And there are some guys that we're maybe not as high on. We come back in and get Jalen Tolbert and Tyrion Davis Price. Tolbert, obviously very buzzy over the last several days as the Cowboys are talking about him potentially being the rookie who has the biggest impact this season. So you're talking about a mid third round pick and a guy who could be relevant even in redraft, right? Tyrion Davis Price, a day two pick on a team where <laughs> their running backs often get thrust into a role where they score fantasy points for you right away. We have the 310. We select Tyquan Thornton. That's a top 50 pick on a team with a rising QB that needs a speed wide receiver. So, I mean, these are not throwaway players, even though most of them probably are going to end up not having a huge impact, you know, big picture or down the line, but some of them will, right? So in this case, the, the picks we end up making kind of in that range are Tolbert, uh, Davis Price, and Thornton. The picks that we give up become John Mechie and Justin Ross. Obviously, Mechie is someone who's interesting because he kind of has fallen into this mid-third area. And again, you're talking about a top 50 wide receiver. Okay. And so when you have a lot of picks as well, one of the things that happens is once you target your guys, some other players will be pushed down. And especially if they're pushed down because of the way you're drafting and they're a little bit below ADP, then there's going to be somebody out there who's saying, oh, well, this person is a value. So maybe I'm willing to actually pay a little bit more than I otherwise would because this guy has fallen below ADP. So you get that value of, out of it when you move from that pick. So that's sort of a secondary value that also comes to you. Obviously, Justin Ross is, is someone we've talked about a lot and has been, uh, Colin, he's he's sort of been the star of, of some of our Rotoviz YouTube videos. People love to go over there and, and check out the Justin Ross content. So we know that he's someone we would have loved to have gotten, but when you're moving through and you're making these picks, you can sort of pick and choose and try and get the higher values or at the very least get your guys. And so... One of the things that we're looking at here with these trades and this overall sort of construction method is that the pieces fit together nicely, right? They're not isolated from one another. The next trade we're going to talk about is the idea of perpetual reloading. It is something that we talk about a lot on the show and you do obviously with Ben. We talk about it across the website as well. And that is the idea of keeping that championship window open where we're continuously adding in those options for players, you know, to keep... <laughs> To keep kind of circling uh, the blood and the oxygen through the veins of your team, I guess we'll say. Um, but when we look at it, you talk about moving a franchise foundation piece. So in that last trade, you moved far, Jonathan Taylor, but you did trade away Joe Burrow. But this trade is one that you completed with Blair Andrews, and it is Javante Williams and Michael Carter for J.K. Dobbins, 2023 first, second, and third. So this one's a fun one. All running backs involved, and basically the whole hall of picks. Uh, for next year so uh, i thought this was a very very fun trade what were some of the thoughts on that and, and how difficult was it to make the move yeah so this one was tough right because we've been talking about jonte williams really since the final third of last season he pops in the advanced stats explorer where we have all of this great info from sports info solutions you can go in there and check out how these guys are doing before contact after contact evasion rate all of that type of thing we see that you know he looks like the best pure runner in football and you know he could be ascending to a top five pick this year in redraft he could be the 101 in 2023 and so when you're looking at getting rid of him you're feeling like this is very risky Right. But this is also sort of the foundation of perpetual reloading is that when you get these players who have huge value, you have to be willing to at least consider 
making a trade. That doesn't mean you go out and move all of these guys, right? But you have to at least be willing to consider making the trade because that is in many cases going to be the peak of their value. There are a lot more things that can hurt Javante Williams than, than that can help him at this point, even though he could rise to be the one one a lot more potential roadblocks that would come up. The other thing that happens here and to sort of center this trade in context, this occurs right before the triplex cut down date and about a month before the NFL draft. And it's another fun part of the triflex where you got to cut down to 16 players. That is another time period that really facilitates trades is, you know, some managers are kind of filling out their roster. Other managers are trying to get down. You're trying to get down in a way that, helps you as opposed to hurts you you're trying to move some value into the future and if you're a savvy manager looking at someone who's trying to get down and you're thinking well you know this guy might actually move Javante Williams because he's trying to get down to 16 so let's make sure we look at that so again you're looking at this from both sides and one of the things we talk about all the time is that these trades should be win-win right they should be a win for you they should be a win for your trade partner they should be a loss for the other 10 people in the league and you want to establish yourself as someone who's going to make fair trades, who's going to respond in a timely and friendly manner to trade offers, even the bad ones. You want to take that information that comes in a bad trade offer and start the discussion. Now you know who they want on your team. You know who they're willing to give up. Even if those two pieces don't sync, it gives you information that you can use in other potential trades, right? So getting back to the situation with Williams, it was a case where we're thinking, okay, can we move value into 2023 we know that this is a potentially elite draft coming i think that sometimes that can be pretty overstated i think that one of the things that we saw from this draft is at least through the 110 and the very least the 109 very very interesting and then again once you kind of get to the 206 to the 306 actually quite a bit of value it's sort of in those flat areas where maybe you thought you were going to get a little bit more than you're potentially going to get that you're disappointed so the question with 2023 is how great will it be at the top? How much value will there be? How much value will there be in rounds two and three? But we know that there's some long-term strategic advantage to moving value into that draft. And then we're looking, okay, well, who would be somebody who would come and help us now? Because we're going to have to play some running backs. We do want to win this season. You know, perpetual reloading is not like a permanent tank, right? You, you are going to try and go out there and win. And so we want to get Dobbins back. We want to get somebody who maybe is not that he's not trendy i mean people love dobbins they can see the situation he would come back and score an absolute ton of points in this baltimore ravens offense so even though he's probably not going to catch a lot of passes and that's a key demerit for fantasy you could see him as sort of a low-end version of derrick henry or nick chubb even though obviously the stylistic uh, profile of those guys is a little bit different but could score a ton of points without catching a lot of passes you know what would the price be there so we do make the move, right? We acquire J.K. Dobbins in a one, two, three. We move Javante Williams and Michael Carter. Now the two and three might seem a little bit beside the point, but from that conversation we just had about how the 308 came into play with making this big deal and then sort of explaining how we were able to make a bunch of picks from the late two through really all the way across round three and get some of our targets. The more picks you have, the easier that is to do. You've got to start that and make that acquisition process kind of go throughout the entire off season. You're not going to be able to get to all those picks, you know, by kind of working the phones in the last week. Right. So we work on this throughout, but one of the things that comes into play here, and one of the reasons why I think this is an easy trade and a good example is that in many ways we got very lucky and it worked out extremely well for us, but it's also easy to see a scenario where it wouldn't have worked out. And The key point that I would make here is that even if it hadn't worked out, it would have been the right move to make because we're again trying to create as many paths to winning and we're trying to diversify our risk and maximize the different ways that we could win. And so there is a window here where it looks like Melvin Gordon is not only not going to come back and hit Javante Williams, He's but he might actually land in Baltimore, yeah. right? And and hit J.K. Dobbins. So you're hoping that that doesn't happen. But even if that had been the case, it would have been the right move, I think, for us to make. And it's not that you know, I was off of Michael Carter either. He was the other piece that we had to include in order to get this package of Dobbins on the one, two, three. And 
you know, that's not nothing either. I mean, during this time period, I actually acquired Carter for AJ Dillon and you know, you and I love AJ Dillon, but in that case, it was a situation where Aaron Jones presence on the Packers was guaranteed Brees Hall's presence or Kenneth Walker's presence on the Jets was merely theoretical at that point. Now it did happen to be that the Jets added Hall and that, you know, is frustrating for Carter's value. It, it hits him hard. Right. But at that time period, it's one where it could go either way. And so you're, you're factoring that in. So in this case, we end up moving two guys who get hit. We acquire Dobbins, we acquire the one, two, three, but it's not something where we're looking back on that and saying, Oh, look, we were so smart and we did this and we won this trade and et cetera, et cetera. That's not it at all. I mean, this is a good trade for our partner in the trade for our opponent in the league. One of the things that happens here and one of the things that we were looking at and had to consider is that he's got Justin Herbert and Dak Prescott, right? A lot of other firepower at running back and tight end. This is a deal where at the point, especially when we make it, it looks like we're making a deal with someone where the, you know, it's going to be like the 110, the 210, the 310. And so that also factors into the equation. But the tiny little thing that can happen there, one thing you want to keep in mind before you reject trades with managers in your league who have good teams is that if in fact you agree to a trade that seems to be, you know, very balanced, it's actually a case where you've got a better path to winning in the kind of the medium term than they do simply because it's hard to take your team from like the 109, 110 and like lock in the 112, right? It's very difficult to ever lock in a championship but at the same time, some bad luck can really move you back into the pack. I always think about this league that Curtis Patrick and I are in, where we started the league out with like four of the top 10 players. And we've never made the playoffs or even gotten close because those guys keep getting hurt. And so we traded some of our future picks thinking, you know, we've got the best players in this league. You know, how can that not work out? And that pick ends up being like the 104. And you're thinking, well, you know, that that was unfortunate. You want to make sure you're thinking about that from the opposite perspective as well. In this case, the other manager has DeAndre Hopkins. And so now not only have these two running backs gotten hit, but a key wide receiver starting piece has gotten hit. The team is still good. I wouldn't be surprised at all if he competes for a championship. And yet there is now this sort of chain of events that has occurred that could move those picks, you know, into the 104, 105, 106 range. And suddenly you're feeling very, very good about this trade. Yeah. And this is it. Like it's a really fun trade, you know, with a lot of name value in it and with, the picks being the first, second, and third round picks. My last question on this one is, you in this situation received round one, two, and three picks. You mentioned that in the league with Curtis Patrick previously that you traded away some of those kind of picks. Um, what's your thoughts on moving You know, a lot of draft capital from one year in a deal like this? Would, would that be something you would recommend if the situation was right, or would you be trying to avoid giving up like a first, second, and third in a, a trade? I think it depends a lot on what you are trying to accomplish and what your flexibility is for moving the pieces back. One of the other things that I will do, sort of the other approach to startups and to building dynasties would be to move a lot of the future trade value, so a lot of the future picks into the current year but when you do that, you have to use them on young players. And that's what this other manager has done, right? He's used these picks on Javante Williams and Michael Carter. And so this could still very much work out for him. I mean, Javante Williams could go out there and just absolutely tear up the league this year. He's going to be able to move Williams for picks that are equivalent or better next year at, at the time of the draft, right? And so what you get in that situation is you get the player, you can play them, you get their points. And then you, you trade the back picks. out of it and you also get the picks, right? So you have to look at it from that perspective as well. And so it's a little bit your mindset and your psychology. Are you willing to continue to move pieces? If you get a little bit stuck to where once you've acquired someone, then you won't move them again because you don't ever want to experience that loss of seeing your star play on somebody else's roster. Then I think, I mean, it's almost something where it's counterintuitive, but you have to be more patient because you'll get in this situation where your players start to age. You don't have any picks because you've moved them and suddenly you're out of this permanent championship window and you're into the rebuilding window. And that rebuild can take a very long time. 
Yeah, and the other part there that you touched on is, you know, the profile of the player. So at Javante Williams in this case where or you talked with Jonathan Taylor earlier, you can get that player on, but then in a you know, a year or two we can still move back out and you're not really it's almost like you're putting it into a like a short term loan or something, you're getting that dividend back at the end. Whereas if you're doing that for and look, we're not doing this to bang on, say, Derek Henry, for example, but there's a situation then where that there disappears very, very quickly and you get no return on that investment. So yeah, uh, really fun going through those. There is a third trade. I did say at the start of this, there's three. We're going to leave that, Sean, as a tease for the listeners to check it out on rotaviz.com. And that is involving some of the, the rookies uh, for 2022. And it also involves some of our favorite tight ends and Pat Fairmuth and Albert Okuabunam. Um, so definitely head on over and check that out. 